On a summer's night in 1989, Tiananmen Square was a war zone. The People's Liberation Army fought its way into Beijing from four directions with orders to converge on the square. Unarmed citizens and students faced armored personnel carriers, tanks, and soldiers armed with semi-automatic weapons. By 5.30 a.m. on June the 4th, 1989, the army's mission had been accomplished. Gradually, the dawn came up. In Beijing, you know how misty it is, smoggy. This wasn't a sunrise. This was like a grayness gradually acquiring some sort of light. And where all this life had been was this quadrangle of tanks facing out. All the students were gone. And I just stood there and I watched. T.D. Ullman was staying at this Beijing hotel which has a commanding view of Shangan Avenue, the Avenue of Eternal Peace, that runs directly into Tiananmen Square. On these balconies, Western reporters and photographers had crouched, often under gunfire, to record the events of the night of June 3rd, 4th. Then, at noon on the 5th, when the army seemed in complete control, something remarkable happened on Shangan Avenue, immediately below. The tanks danced. It was obscene. It was like an obscene dance. They just didn't roll out. They swiveled around. God knows why they did that. And then the moment came, which has intrigued you and fascinated and moved the world. You stand there. You're looking down. This tank's coming out. It's got its uh, gun up. And this man just went out and he said, stop. It's absolutely extraordinary. You could look at him as unusually brave, but he probably wasn't. He was probably just an ordinary person who was so disgusted at what he had seen for the last few days. And he said, right, that's it. I'm going out and I'm going to just stand in front of that column. The tank did not try to just run him over. It turned to go around him. And then the young man jumps in front of the tank. And then the tank turns the other way and the young man jumps the other side. They did this a couple of times, and then the tank turned off its motor. And then it seemed to me that all the tanks turned off their motors, because uh, it was really quiet. Standing in front of a column of tanks, no one around him. He was all on his own with his shopping bag in his hand. He climbed on top of the tank, banged on the lid, said, get out of my city. You're not wanted here. We don't know exactly what he said, but it's clear that's what he wanted to say. And I started to cry because I had seen so much shooting and so many people dying that I was sure this man would get crushed. So I remember thinking, I can't cry because I can't see. I want to watch this. During this time, I'm thinking, this guy is going to be killed any moment now. And if he is, I just can't miss this. This is something that he's giving his life for. It's my responsibility to record it as accurately as possible. And then after a while, the young man jumps down, and the tank turns on the motor, and the young man blocks him again. I thought, he's just going to get crushed. I realized that the, the Public Security Bureau had been watching us from the other rooftop by binoculars. So I went in and took the film out of the camera and reloaded it into the plastic film can. And uh, went it to the toilet, took off the top of the toilet and put it in the holding tank, put the toilet top back on. And shortly after that, probably 10, 15 minutes afterwards, the Public Security Bureau broke through the door. They got one other roll of film from the, the shots that I'd taken from the night before, and they were pretty satisfied they'd, they'd cleaned up the situation. About a day and a half later, 
who worked my way back through the back streets to the Beijing Hotel, and luckily nobody had flushed the toilet. So one of the most famous photographs of the 20th century was floating in the top of a lavatory. Floating system. in the top of the toilet and possibly uh, could have been literally flushed, yeah. Images of that extraordinary confrontation became icons of freedom. They have been reproduced on T-shirts and posters ever since. President Bush commended his courage and leaders the world over hailed him. He became an inspiration to millions and he changed lives forever. For all my years conducting investigation of human rights abuses, I never forgot this young man who stand in front of tanks. It's not only me never forgot, the world did not forget him. I spent, you know, years in the labor camp. I confronted the regime also in the labor camp. That image actually played a key role to me. He wanted to change China. But what he did was help to change the Soviet Union. I went to a number of countries in Eastern Europe before the Berlin Wall came down and I was complimenting their courage. They said, if that kid in China stood in front of those tanks, we can do what we're doing. What this young man did was in effect change the world. Within minutes of his incredible act of defiance, Tank Man was hustled away, by whom we do not know, and vanished. For years, his fate and identity have remained a mystery. But it seems he was not a student, more likely an ordinary working man. He didn't look at all like a student. He looked like someone on his way to work or who just knocked off and was on his way home doing the shopping on the way home. In a sense, he stood for the ordinary people. But who was this man and what happened to him? Old economic dogmas have been cast aside in favor of raw capitalism. The results are dramatic. Since the Beijing massacre, the economy has grown at a staggering rate of 9% a year and is now the fourth largest in the world. 15 years ago, this entire skyline didn't exist, just paddy fields. China's rise is the story of the 21st century, and it is rooted in the events of 1989. You have the crackdown, the closing of the political door. You had to open another door, because if not, the society was going to explode. And the other door was to get rich as glorious. How bizarre that the Communist Party, which has spent decades trying to fight capitalism, should suddenly turn to capitalism as its savior. There was a point to that. This was meant to buy the Communist Party a new lease on life. On the one hand, intimidate opposition for a generation. On the other hand, give the people bread and circuses. And the deal is there must be no challenge to one party rule. That's the terms of today's China. That's the deal. And for many of those who rose against the regime in 1989, principally city people, this deal has paid off. After decades of austerity, they have access to everything money can buy. No dream seems unattainable here, no expense too daunting. One incident in June 1989 that happened to take place under the very noses of Western cameramen. In both cases, the challenge for an authoritarian state is the same. How do you stop one person's example becoming an inspiration to others? How do you prevent the fire from spreading? Beida, the University of Beijing and the most prestigious in all of China. In 1989, Beida was the nerve center of the student movement that would inspire a popular uprising. Today's undergraduates enjoy all the benefits that have flowed into thriving China A. Largely the children of the elite, 
They enjoy freedom of travel and a lifestyle many Western undergraduates might envy. But what do they know of their recent history? I'm going to try a little experiment. Show this picture around and tell me what that picture says to you. Pass them around. They were baffled. After a long silence, one of them whispered, Looks like some military ceremony. The boy whispered back, 89. But the girl made no connection. Does it have any meaning at all? Well, I can see four vehicles. I'm not sure about the context. It might be a parade or something. I really don't know. I'm just guessing. I really can't tell anything from this picture. There's no context. Is this a piece of artwork? Did you make this up? Whatever they might have heard about 1989, it was clear that they had never seen the Tank Man picture. China has at least 35,000 internet police monitoring the country's 111 million internet users. For more sophisticated controls, China relies on Western technology. When we in the West search for images of Tiananmen Square on Google, photos of Tank Man pop up immediately. Move through the selection of 18 pages and Tank Man appears again and again. When people in China make the same entry on their Google search engine, they get just three pages, featuring maps, architecture, cooking hints, and smiling tourists posing in the square, but not one single image of the tank man. Journey in search of tank man brought us face to face with that other great mystery, China itself. Can the leadership's great gamble of economic reform and political repression succeed? Or will the spirit of tank man inevitably rise again? The power of that story is not getting weaker because of the time, because we don't know who he is. It's actually getting stronger. That ultimate spirit of a freedom will last longer than the strength of tanks and machine guns. In the long frame of history, it's the human freedom, courage, dignity, will stay and prevail. That picture will testify that forever. <laughs>